The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Roxon. Welcome to another Engine Room podcast. Today, we're going to straddle the divide between the engine room of a small business and the solution to an entire industry. Um, I've got a, a gentleman here who's very passionate about not just solving his own practices problems, but the, the, the way in which he can sort of across the board solve problems for other practitioners, which indeed then solves problems such as the chronic underinsurance in our industry. And without any further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Brett Wright. Thanks for having me, Roxy. Appreciate it. And look, Brett, we spoke off uh, off air a few minutes ago, and um, you know your stories. You've been doing this a while, and I was very, very impressed with with uh, sort of your application and aptitude. But maybe give us a bit of a feel for you know why uh, sort of your backstory. I know that your dad's in in the game, and you've you've been a partner of his for many years. But but maybe how you've got into pure play life insurance, why you stayed, and um, you know a bit more about yourself. Great. Uh, thanks, Roxy. Um, yeah, so I've yeah practically born into advice. So dad started our advice business in 1987, the the year I was born. So yeah, when I when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did other things for a couple of years, and it was the income protection policy that my dad bought me for my 18th birthday that I eventually claimed on. Um, that had me thinking maybe it's time I joined the family business. So. Um, that was in 2006. Um, yeah, got got in, started in so, admin. So sorry, <coughs> tell me a bit more about that. So first of all, um, yourself and your dad um, shared the, the great year of 1987, which I believe is Bon Jovi's Slippery When Wet album. Um, but you were early days, you, you, got, you got a policy for income protection. Um, and what, what job were you doing that you injured yourself? So, yeah, I was the driver for the policy was I was rowing surfboats. So, that's my sport, uh, surf lifesaving and rowing surfboats. Um, plenty of jokes that you can make about how they pick a boaty. Um, you know, throw a brick and the one that doesn't duck is, is the one that gets the gig. Yes, but I was, yeah, I did, um, after I left school, I managed at McDonald's for for a year. So, that's where I, you know, worked at, at high school as well. And then I started managing a couple of boost juices and um, and I invented a piece of equipment for boost juice as well and sold that to every store around the country. And oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. And it was um, due to the surf boats. That's where dad said, if you injure yourself, I'm not paying for you for, for the rest of your working life. So, here's an income protection policy. And He's charming, isn't he? he very yeah. charming. Yeah, very charming. <laughs> he loves me. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Um, and yeah, it was at training one day. Um, I was just on a, on a paddle board and took a wave that I shouldn't have and fell down the face of it and snapped my metacarpals in half and broke my hands. So, um, thanks to that income protection policy, I claimed the accident benefit. I wasn't able to make juices at Boost Juice and it was during that time while I was waiting for my hand to heal that I started getting interested in, in income protection and what life insurance does and yeah, that's when and I- what age were you? Uh, that was when I was 20. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so really early days and- yeah. um, 
um, you know, it, it, that, that, that particular event's probably fast tracked, um, your, your entry into the life insurance. And so, so after you've, um, uh, got out of boost juice, having, made the, the the thing that my kids probably buy a slurpee or something like that i'd like to not thank you for the amount of money that's gone into that business over the years um you've then um gone and, and sat down with your father and said well that thing that you just did that worked out that's like magic that i get paid um for an accident cover um more people should have that is that what was going through your mind yeah i like i'd always had an understanding of what the business was about so um yeah, Dad was always pretty good at, at claim stories and you know and you know letting us know of what the business did. Um, we had a we had a really you know good upbringing where our and where about did you live? What, what part of the country? Uh, Southern Shire in Sydney. So, yeah, in yep. Sydney. Yeah, yep. yeah. So thirty minutes south of CBD. Yeah. So he had a home office. Um, and yeah. So we'd see Dad before we went to school. We'd you know when the bus came in after school we'd run into the office and, and see dad as well. And so there's always something going on. I always had a pretty good general idea of, of what he did, but it wasn't until it, you know, really, you know, been, until I claimed that I, I really understood the value of, of what we do. So. And um, so what, what was your first role in, in that business? Obviously it wasn't handwriting, but um, you know, yeah. what was your actual first role within the business? And the business is business funding and planning or, or BFP for short. Is that yeah, right? BFP, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I, I started in admin. So, um, yeah, started in admin. Uh, you know, we had a, a paper based office. There was a massive room with a wall of files for our, you know, sort of four or 500 clients. And, um, and it was a pain in the butt. Every time you had to work on a file or the phone rang and you'd have to go to the room and grab the file and, and away you go and then go put it back and then the next task and so yeah that it was in admin chief photocopy officer yeah no yeah. worries and when i look at the the business today there's um there it's not your normal sort of crafted life insurance business it looks like you're very focused on on the business side of it is that correct and and or has that evolved um it's evolved over time yeah so when i joined the business uh, we did everything. We did investments. We did super. We did insurance, um, and that was you know that was what we did. But what we really excelled at and really enjoyed doing was the insurance work. So um, yeah, after after you know, starting in the, in the admin space, and that's where we converted the office to an electronic office, and um, we we'll, yeah sort of pioneered that in in the practice space and. Um, and yeah, that that's and then my interest in advice, you know, ticked up, and I just specialised in insurance. And then and then not long after that, we made the decision for the business to go risk only. What what, what year was that that you dropped the the wealth uh, creation or wealth wealth side? Uh, it would have been 2014, 2015, okay. yeah, from memory. So you weathered the GFC. <laughs> we did, um, yeah. And uh, you've, you've you've managed to, to power through it, and then you've. Um, because there's a theme that we're, we're getting when we're talking to practices about specialisation. Um, so apart from it being less complicated, what commercial drivers did you have in, in wanting to specialise um, in, in life? Were you, were you getting referrals from other professionals that were, or what was it that drove you? Um, yeah, mate, you're the, you know, the foundation of financial planning is often risk advice and, and an easy, ref like an, it's an easier referral for life insurance for an accountant or a mortgage broker or a GI broker. Whereas, um, for investments, it can be a lot harder. So, um, so the, the referrals weren't the driver of us going, you know, risk only. It was just, that's what we really love doing and it's what we're passionate about. And, um, you know, FOFA was sort of kicking off in 2014 and, um, we just didn't enjoy doing investments in super anymore. So, yeah. And um, you, you've grown up inside the business. Um, you're, you're a parent yourself. Um, yep. It potentially could be a multi-generational business, although, you know, what we're going to get to as far as what you're looking um, to, to roll out in, in the technology solution side um, might fast track you, you into a bit more of a tech um, business, which, you, which is what you've got. Um, yep. Went back in 2014, were the driver of the business still referrals from existing clients or did you get like, because you know, off air you mentioned that, that there was an accounting solution that you um you looked at doing. You you've been a solutions person. Can I ask? Were you a frustrated engineer? Is that <laughs> is that what it was? I mean, you, you did mention that um, the brick thrown at you concept, but but you know from in your childhood was there very much an analytical bent to to the way you thought about things? Um, 
I just get frustrated by problems that aren't solved. <laughs> That's basically, yeah, what it is. So there's probably a hint of my wife would say perfectionism in there as well. Like, a, yeah, like I'm, I'm an analytical person. I, yeah, I want problem solved, and um, I think yeah, in, uh, you know, in the in the life insurance space, you know, in those early days around 2012, had success, and um, I wanted to grow a solution to to you know work with more referral partners and, and and grow the business. So that's yeah, we developed that technology SMSF life insurance reviews, and um, you know when the CIS Act changed, so it did the the uh, the life insurance compliance as part of investment strategies for for self managed super funds. So so with uh, so that's uh, you sold that as a kind of a solution on a B two B to other accounting firms, did you? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and how did that did that funnel business into your mothership firm, or what was the outcome? Yeah. So with that. We always, yeah, so we opened it up as a platform, so not for the purpose of, you know, funneling business to us, but it was any advisor could use it to work with their accounting partners right, to, okay. to do it. So, yep. yeah, it was a it was a SaaS play. Yep. Um, yeah, so, it, yeah, it was a good product and it, and it worked well and um, a couple of years later, we expanded that into, it pivoted and expanded that into KPRM, which made that functionality. So, um, life insurance, integrating life insurance and advice and, renewals and review offers into accounting, mortgage broking and general insurance broking businesses as well. Which so. is absolutely complimentary. Yeah. You know, so so the, you mentioned that you're only looking you like solving problems. So what was the biggest problem in the life insurance sort of landscape? And uh, hopefully part of your answer is something to do with the engine room of the advice practices. So so what you, you tell me what the biggest problem was that you identified and maybe give us an entree into parts of the solution that you're looking to, to, to offer everyone. Yeah, so I think the biggest problems are obviously cost to serve. So, you know, all, all the listeners will understand the, the time and the cost. To- so cost to serve an existing client or cost to serve or to bring on a, a client or everything? Everything, yeah, both. Wow. So um, if we put a blanket over it, it, it's cost to serve, it's complexity associated with needing to use multiple systems to do life insurance advice and provide ongoing services. Um, and then you've got that compliance as well. You know, since LAF came in, so you know, compliance ramped up, revenues dropped and you know, we've got this situation where you know, providing life insurance advice to, to most Australians economically unviable at the moment and, and most advisors are targeting high premium needs. Well, you, you, before the before this uh, podcast, you mentioned that you, you historically, with your practice, you've done you know significant life insurance premiums. I think you mentioned you've done a hundred thousand dollar premiums, et cetera, and they're all the ones that you want. And 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 however, you also mentioned that there was a Deloitte survey just recently mentioning the reduction in people insured. What was the numbers again? Yeah, off um, off the top of my head. So the I think it's over the last four or five years, the number of lives insured is reduced by twenty five percent. I think it is. So and that's well. I mean that it, that's pretty well documented in in the Australian media. No one really understands how they're going to fix it. Um, however, yeah. um, you know you've got a homegrown approach to doing that. Whilst I'm also then having a sort of chat about uh, y- y- your backstory there, what was your who were you licensed with? Incidentally, with your life insurance business. Um, so yeah, we we started with financial services partners. So um, that's who we were, we were licensed with, and then they mer- they got they merged in under IWF, which then got merged in with M three, um, and now we're with Australian Unity. Yeah, right. Okay, and yeah. so you, you found your way into that kind of business. Okay, oh, cool. I've, I've interviewed quite a few people in Australian Unity. They seem to be relatively happy. Shout out to the Australian Unity um, we, business. We are happy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell me then, in two thousand and um, uh, twelve, you did the self managed super fund um, business, and at what stage did you get a feeling that you're onto something as far as solving the problems for other life insurance practitioners? And maybe guess an entree into the solution that you're looking to roll out as we speak. Great, um, yeah. So the the SMSF life insurance reviews platform. Um, when we pivoted that into KPRM and really started working with um, you know a couple of ASX listed companies and helping them drive their their referral partner relationships and, and growth that way. That's when we knew. That's when we knew we were onto something. Um, well, did it blow up? Like did it did it work really well above expectations? It did. It, it worked too well to the point where um, they'd be getting hundreds of referrals from their referral networks, but not being able to service them because of that cost to serve, the complexity, and the compliance risk. So, so you've opened up one of the the sort of pinch points 
and um, which is wonderful, right? It's always good to get that. But um, you've you've then uh, um, had a problem at the next stage. That's right. Yeah, uh, meeting the demand. Yeah. So um, yeah, there's no shortage of demand of demand for risk advice, but um, you know, it's how do we actually get through the risk advice process and then, and the ongoing service piece with renewals and reviews and alterations as well. Um, that is the bottleneck for practices at the moment, the bottleneck to their growth. Um, and that's where, you know, those businesses using our KPRM platform were having those issues. I was having those issues in my business, you know, post LIF as well because remuneration dropped and compliance, you know, doubled or quadrupled. Um, and, we're, and we're going, well, you know, if I've got 30 years to run until retirement in this industry, we need to create an industry solution. Yeah, look, and it was a perfect storm. And for those um, uh, for those who are new to the game, the the LIF um, sort of framework reduced the commissions to sixty percent um, for upfront, down from what everyone was typically taking around eighty percent um, on a hybrid. And it was that extra twenty percent which really um, uh, was probably the the wriggle room if you were slightly inefficient. But now there's nowhere to hide, is there, in the engine room for life insurance businesses? No, no, there's not, and. Um and you might think going from 80 to 60, oh, that's not that significant, but the actual work around the compliance piece, so the advice process and the documentation and SOAs started blo- you know, ballooning out. And um, and so when, when you cut that revenue and you add the complexity in the advice process with the compliance, um, it you know becomes unviable and most of and you know that's where we've seen a lot of advisors say I'm just not going to offer life insurance advice anymore, um, or I'm not going to see new clients and just service my existing clients and um, you know it's quite it's quite alarming you know out of the sixteen thousand advisors in, in the in the industry I think it's seventeen hundred right. 75% of the industry's new business. And I think, you know, to quote an advisor ratings report from earlier this year, there's 150 risk specialists left. That's wild. So, we could actually yeah. put them all here in my office. We could. We could. Um, yeah. uh, that'd be a, 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 a wild party, to be honest. Uh, you can cut that, sound guy. Um, we've had this conversation before. Um, okay. So, with, um, tell me then this solution that um, I'm very excited um, to hear about. Um, my background, uh, is running a business um, uh, that had uh, life insurance components um, and also servicing a lot of other clients um, through a through a, a back office and a, and a sort of a business partner um, in the Philippines. Um, we just see that it appeared that life insurance engine rooms were just left behind compared to all the money that was going into making wealth management and wealth practices more efficient. Um, what was what was the the stimulation for you kicking the business off, and um, maybe give us a bit of an overview? Um, yeah, so the the stimulation or the you know why we founded it was just immense frustration, frustrated by how complex and expensive it had become for you know consumers to access the advice that they need and the products that they need, um, and then equally as frustrated by how you know risky and time consuming and unprofitable it become for advisors and licensees and insurers to help people you know protect their families their incomes their businesses as well so um that's where you know we just went right how are we going to fix this industry issue you know no industry stakeholder can solve the problems on their own so that's where we started um that's where we you know formed together the life bid working group so so life bid, the, mm. this is what everyone's talking about. I've had people on this podcast telling me I have to speak um, to you guys because it isn't doom and gloom. And you know, at the end of the the the, the tunnel is a, is a light. And um, you know, for years they thought it was just an oncoming train, but they're potentially saying that with life bid, it could actually be the end of of, of the tunnel. So tell me about uh, life bid. Um, there's stakeholders involved. Um, and a uh, brutal question to start with, why didn't the insurers just sort this out? Um, well, it takes, yeah, as, as I mentioned before, it's it's not just an insurer problem. It's a licensee issue. It's an advisor issue. It's a regulator issue. It's a government issue. Yeah, no single stakeholder can solve it on, the, on, the, on their own. We all need to work together. So that's why we put together the working group for LifeBid. So we've got six of nine retail life insurers supporting us. We've got a critical mass of licensees um, supporting us as well who represent self-employed, employed and self-licensed businesses as well. Um, and then we've also got our, our advocacy partners as well um, there too. So, And when you got together on this working group, um, you know, you brought a lot of a lot of history of your own individual practice that you've had for, for many years um, and that your father still um, is involved in. Um, 
What did you find that was the similarities of frustrations with yourself and, and other practices and what did you discover through that process? Um, yeah, so we've all got the same frustrations. It was all around we're needing to use, you know, multiple different systems that often don't talk to each other. So we've got, you know, having to rekey data and the inefficiency that comes from that and the margins of error that comes from that. We've got, you know, 50-page statements of devices that are generated in Word documents. Um, we've got a client experience that doesn't live up to, you know, 2023 expectations. Well, where what do you think it is? I mean, take me through what a 2023 consumer wants for their life insurance ex- experience. Yeah, well, it's not a 20 to 40 page fact find and a 50 page SOA. That's for sure. I think they, they want the Netflix experience. So they, you know, they want to, yeah, they want to talk to their advisor. They want to work with their advisor, but they want it to be done efficiently and, and digitally as well. So that's, um, I think that's the next iteration at, at the moment as advisors. We're, you know, picking up our clients, driving them down a blockbuster to get, a VHS and then we're doing that each year at renewal time uh, when really they want that Netflix experience where they can you know do what they need to do on on any device and um, and then get on with it so and um, so in relation to uh, LifeBid maybe give us an idea of of how it solves or how, how it's it's purporting to solve the problems of onboarding a client and and from discussion earlier it's got to do with connectivity so because you're part of an ecosystem and you mentioned six of nine of the life insurers and look I, I'll probably chat later about that I mean if you're a life insurer and you're you're listening to this here's someone who's desperately wanting to keep you in business in in Australia and you've just lost a million customers so um, you know maybe I can be that guy and you probably can't but <laughs> I'm more than happy to do that but um, yeah, what, 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 how, how are you solving those both problems? Because it's a big motherhood statement. Yeah, so I think, you know, we're doing what it says on the tin, fixing life insurance advice. Um, how we're doing that is we are developing an end-to-end platform for advisors to use uh, to manage their clients' life insurance needs and upfront and on an ongoing basis as well. So... And so does that sit alongside the current tech stack? You know, if I'm talking to um, other uh, sort of GMs and, and, and COOs and they, 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 they rattle off their, their tech stack and it could be anything from Midwinter, Advice Logic, or X Plan. So does it sit alongside or is it, or is it, does it, does it complement them or is it, does it replace part of that process? Um, so if, if you're a risk specialist, what we're, what we're, um, the end goal for LifeBid is that you'll be able to use LifeBid to do your referrals, your new advice, your renewals, yep. your reviews, your alterations, your claims, task and workflow management. So, um, we want to, we want to take away the need for, or the current need for advisors to use multiple often siloed systems and yep. put that into one system. If you're a holistic planner, it will sit alongside complementary to your tech stack and, so that you can get your client's life insurance needs looked after really quickly in LifeBid and then use your other systems for investments and super and retirement planning and all that sort of stuff. What's an example? Give me a couple of examples of how LifeBid removes some of the friction. Yep. Okay. So, um, you know, typically it's pretty well documented that the average, you know, new business process takes 10 to 15 hours for, you know, to help a, to help a client with basic life insurance needs. And, um, in one end to end, in one end to end process, we're cutting that time and cost to serve up to 90%. So, um, education, so educating the client about what covers are relevant to them, the scoping and the type of advice that they want, whether it's, you know, comprehensive or goals based or, you know, this wants some options right through to the fact finding, the needs analysis, pre-assessments, um, research and comparisons, strategy, um, soon to be the SOA, which is you know, soon to be gone, but you know, that fit for purpose advice document done digitally all the way through to uh, implementing the cover as well. And a big Man- part of that sounds like a big, a, a big, sorry to interrupt, a big part of that sounds like you really had to get everyone involved. So how hard was it I mean, you had some track record, right? You'd done this before and you've got some, some lineage in, in the life and change industry. But how was it, how hard was it to get like minded peers who, um, I'm looking on your website, you've, you've got the um, Ausbrokers Life, Australian Unity, Centrepoint, Fortnum, Synchron, MBS um, as, as foundation advice partners. So getting them and also getting all the insurers on at once, because if you didn't have the whole myriad of stakeholders, then it wouldn't have worked. So personally, how much personal effort and um, combination of threat and beg did you have to do to get this going? Um, 
it, it wasn't really threat and beg. It was just, yeah, it was just a, alignment of, right, well, we need to fix advice. We need to fix life insurance advice. Um, that's going to benefit consumers. That will benefit advisors. It will benefit licensees. It will benefit insurers. Um, and then how are we going to work together as an industry working group as an in, as a, and as an industry project to make the solution happen? So, um you know, we all we all have different interpretations of what life insurance advice looks like, but how do we come up with a platform and a solution that cuts the time and cost to make risk advice economically viable for for you know most, if not all, Australians, um, and do that in a way that everybody can compete on a fair and level playing field as well? Because at the end of the day, licensees compete against each other, insurers compete against each other as well, and yeah, so that's. Um, so I think the group came together on a common ground of we need to fix life insurance advice for the benefit of consumers and, and the wider industry, um, and and that's where yeah we've come. That's where that's that's how we got everybody together. It was it was a huge effort. It wasn't beg and threat, but it was you know a huge effort aligning everybody's interests. I know. I mean, the figures of I think you mentioned one hundred and fifty or one hundred and seventy life insurance specialists in Australia, in Australia is just um, just. I mean, those people could easily have just shut up shop and just said, well, we've got this oligopoly. Um, they're probably going to make money if they're big enough anyway. But I think it's, it's the nature of financial services and wanting to help not just our clients, but each other that they've, they've sort of jumped on this, this to enable, um, in particular, those, those businesses that do life insurance as well as their, as their, as their wealth. Because I really think that they're the most challenged when it comes to the profitability of that division within their business because mm. they lack the scale and the operations, even if, if, if it's, if it's homegrown to be able to compete. And, and how will life bid then work in sort of a, a one or two person, uh, practice? What, what, what will it bring to them as far as retention of clients? So you've got a book of business. Um, does there, is there flows of information? It sounds like the insurers are on board to, to flow the data. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So the insurers are not just, you know, working with us on the new business process, but also the renewals and the review process. So, um, if you think about, you know, having your list of renewals all in one spot, you're not having to check multiple places to get your renewal lists, um, generating the, re- the renewal packs for you so that you're not having to spend that time getting data from portals and putting together schedules and, and, you know, revisiting why do they have this cover? Um, then, you know, LifeBeat will manage the review of that renewal pack with the client and the advisor as well. And if they'd like to make any changes, just streamlining that that alteration process as well. I feel like the company that's going to get hurt the most out of this is the the company that provides the hold music for the life insurers. <laughs> I think there's going to be a massive run on that. As as much as as much as we've all got uh, very accustomed to the literally six pieces of music that are on the uh, the insurers, um, you know, eliminating that uh, because the clients of the practice, they don't care how much work you've got to do. They just care. They want the Netflix experience, as you said. Yeah. They want it to be seamless. And it's actually utterly befuddling to the Australian public that it is so complicated. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And and it doesn't doesn't need to be. You started your tech team solving this problem in 2014. And there are lots of people in financial advice who um, are either working with businesses in tech or whatnot. I'm actually interested in how'd you put it together? So, um, what's the, you know, do you speak to stakeholders first? Do you go and find a, a development company? Is it in house? Is it out house? What have you tried? And, and what would you, what are the cautionary tales and what's worked for you? Um, yeah. So to start off with, I, I have a software design background. I did software design at school. So, you know, writing requirements and system design and things like that, you know, had a, a good understanding of. Finding developers is hard. So we initially, you know, worked with, went down the agency route. Yep. Um, and, you know, that had its benefits and also its challenges as well, you know, because they, they, they have a certain business model. Um, and then once we started getting serious, that's where, uh, that's where we, you know, that's when you hire your first full time developer and then you hire your next developer and then you hire a UI UX and then, and you grow the team from there. So, um, yeah, so that that's the journey that we went on was yeah starting out going well this is a solution this is a problem that we want to build a solution for going down the agency route and then um, and then yeah and then hiring our own team. I want to ask a few other questions because um, you know I'm really enthusiastic about the outcome of LifeBid, yep. but I also need to know um, a bit about the process and the people side of it as well because. Um, uh, for instance, you've then you've built this team out directly, and there's a bunch of uh, good-looking people on your website. Um, 
are they all in this country? Are they remote? Are they Sydney based? Like how, how like how do you manage them? I'm, I'm curious because I'm going to compare the notes of how, how you would manage someone in financial services. Yeah. So, um, they're all in this country. They're all in Sydney and they all work for Lifebid. So, um, yeah, well, I live with one of them. Uh, so my wife, Cassandra, finance and project management. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's uh, that's an easy that's an easy box to tick. But um, yeah, head of platform development lives you know five minutes from our office. Right. Um, and then you know another developer in our UI UX, they're they're twenty five minutes away from the office. And um, yeah, so we do a hybrid of work from home and and coming into the office and. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's different, different strokes to different folks. Some people just like working from home. Some people like you know working from the office. But um, you know, usual tech business, you stand up and at the start of the day and the end of the day, and and yeah, you, you got to work hard to to build a good culture. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And um, one of the headwinds of of any technology in, in financial services has been the continual regulatory change. And I had a, mm-hmm. a guest actually, Drew Drew Burden. He was in a little while ago, and he mentioned he, he, he quite rattled off. 15 consecutive legislative changes um, in life insurance over a, a small, short period of time. Um, given that you're throwing um, everything, the kitchen sink at, at LifeBit as being a solution for the industry, what's your comments on where you think the, the, the regular, regulatory change is at the moment? Are, are we done? I don't, think it's, I don't think it'll get any harder, but I don't think the tweaks have, will stop. So I think things will just continually get tweaked. So, you know, the, the SOA, for example, um, you know, the, the QAR recommended the removal of it. The, the government's looking at that, you know, to try and do something by the end of the year. Um, but especially when it comes to life insurance advice, I don't think you can get rid of an advice document. You do need that fit for purpose and you do need to demonstrate that the client's making an informed decision. So, Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, an insurer, you know, over a relatively long or short period of time might be up for a large payment and they, and they really need to know that there was a, a, a sensible and professional paper trail for how people made that decision. That's right, yeah. And, and it comes down to as well, every every client's different and everybody assesses their value of cover and, and perception of what they need differently as well. So they naturally are always making trade-offs around the cost of the cover, the benefits that they're getting, um, yeah, and, and the risks of, of not taking out cover that they should have. So um, as advisors, you know, to, to protect ourselves and to demonstrate, you know, the need to show the, the trade-off discussion and the journey that the client's been on to land on the cover that they, that they, um, that they end up taking out. And if I, if I implement LifeBit in, in my uh, sort of multidiscipline practice, mm-hmm. um, um, once, how, how, does, how do I share that data with, um, with, with the other parts of my financial services business? Yeah, so we're um, we're building LifeBid to be open architecture, so there'll be an open API, and um, and yeah, we're we're happy to talk to any other system. So um, yeah, so that's a you know we'll start off with the we'll start off with the incumbents doing integrations with them, um, but yeah, open architecture um, with our open API. And ninety percent saving. I mean, you mentioned before uh, it takes ten to fifteen hours. I imagine the average. Actually, I don't. I mean, you can tell me what's the average life insurance premium. Lord knows, it's three, four thousand dollars a year. Yeah, it's about three grand. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, and uh, to reduce the the cost to actually um, uh, of, of of to serve that down to two, sort of two to three hours, um, should actually put us back on a path of, of bridging that 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 insurance gap. Um, That's right. I, I imagine. And um, what's been the opinion of uh, the, the life insurance? Um, companies, because I was actually thinking, um, it's is there any other country in the world where this has happened as an example? And has there been any other sort of tech solutions that you've looked to and gone, that looks pretty good? I wouldn't mind sort of doing that in this country. Um, the tech solution that I always reference, because if you look at other markets in life insurance, um, you know, like the UK went through their, their, you know, retail distribution reforms, you know, before we did. And I think, you know, they're still, still, you know, grappling with the challenges of that in their market. You know, New Zealand's a little bit behind us, but going through, um, you know, what we're going through, there, there's been, based on the, the regulation and the environment they're operating, there has been no other solution that can handle the regulatory requirements um, in life insurance you know to what to what we need it to be so um i didn't yeah there, there's no 
you know, in our in our research, like we did do extensive research, so we'll have this. Have, are we reinvented the wheel? Has it been done before? And well, no, it hasn't. So, um, and talking to insurers and reinsurers, you know, they're, they're pretty switched on about what's happening in other markets, and you know, there's no other solution you know, in in the market like LifeBit, essentially. So, um, but. Yeah, the piece of software that I always reference is Zero. So, if you think about what accounting was before Zero came along, it was you know desktop systems, uh, manual and clunky processes, heaps of paper shuffling, and then Zero came along and put it all in the cloud. And you know, accountants didn't go out of business; they thrived. Oh, mate, I love yeah. Zero. Love yeah. Zero. I've, I've had accounting businesses, and um, and uh, just the way in which it then talks to other cool things. Yeah, that's the that's the golden part. That's right. That's right. And then, so if you think about, you know, how Zero transformed the account industry, that's the transformation that we want for for life insurance advice in the life insurance industry. So, you know, we're we're using multiple systems that you know are often siloed, and you know, advisors are still doing paper fact finds and sending emails and following up via phone calls and texts and things like that. And you've got to try and you know mash it all into this compliance process and. You know, the genesis of LifeBit is let's get it all into the cloud in one end-to-end system and have an advisor-led technology-driven process. So that, that needs to be the future. By being in the cloud, you're, you're, you're also ticking a bit of a cybersecurity box as well. Um, nothing's perfect up there or down there. I'm not sure where the cloud actually is. That's, <laughs> that's a whole other podcast on that one. Hovering um, it's a philosophical um, podcast. But, um, um, yeah, it, it basically means that, that you, you, you've got less transfer of information. It's all been quite quite secure there. Um, with um, with the future of LifeBit, I've, we were having this conversation and, and you, you've, you've actually put a, a stake in the ground. You've been building this yourself. You've got all the stakeholders in. And I suppose now's the time to gauge the interest for the people you're looking to help. And when I say that, that's the advice community. That's you know? right. Ensemble's all about the positive evolution of financial advice. And, and sometimes when you're doing something uh, and you think it's awesome, it's, you need to actually get that gauge. And, and ultimately, you've got to just do it now. Um, you're looking to democratise the ownership of LifePid. I believe um, one of the first steps in doing that is going to be the ability for um, anyone, but, but, you know, I suppose specifically, ideally, life business operators, people who are listening here on the engine room, you're doing a crowdfund, which, which incidentally, um, Ensemble also did, and it, and it was really galvanised our people. Is that is that something that you, you – you, a strategy of yours, or what made you do that? Uh, yeah, so um – People always said, geez, you're a bit altruistic for this, but we've always wanted to deliver LifeBid as, a, as an industry utility, so something that all stakeholders can access and benefit from and, and use to compete on a fair and level playing field. Um, and yeah, we, we do have, um, we've had some, some advice businesses and advisors, investors as cornerstone investors in LifeBid, and we want to open that up to, to the wider advisor and licensee community to have that opportunity to be owners and, and beneficiaries of what we're doing. Yeah, I think we should probably, um, so we might chuck that in, in, in part of the, the podcast, get a bit of a feel for that. Um, from memory, that's happening in the next, uh, probably one or two weeks or three weeks by the time this drops, um, in, 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 in the early October. Um, so we'll put some details there and, um, you know, I wish you all the best. And, and Ensemble did exactly the same thing. And the whole premise for that was that we wanted to get people, we wanted our story to begin begin with the people we wanted to help which was the advisors yep. advice community and and um and i'm hoping that that's that's exactly the same with with yourself um it now, is yeah yeah and look um with with actually starting a, a tech firm how when did you make the transition from full-time in life bit and 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 as opposed to sort of operating and running your your, your day-to-day life insurance company um yeah so it was 2021 yeah so that was when the LifeBid working group formed and that was when essentially um i went straight in full-time in LifeBid. so right. um we still have our advice business but we have advisors helping us run that so um yeah shout out to those guys thank you for um for assisting there so um but yeah it, the whole focus said yeah, 99 percent of my time is spent on LifeBid. And Brett, look, thanks, thanks for that. Um, what I'm also pretty keen on hearing about is you're in this privileged position where you've, you've actually had a bit of a look at, at the engine rooms of practices out there, um, specifically life insurance practices. And I'd like to know your insights onto the different models 
of of businesses who are who are doing life insurance in Australia. It'd be good to, and maybe just your thoughts on on the future of those those models. Yeah, I think. Um yeah, it's quite diverse. So we've, you know, we've got the the larger players, the big sort of corporatized risk specialists, and they, you know, they know their craft, and um, and they're really big on on JVs and referral partnerships, and that's working really well with them. And that could be JVs with financial planning firms, it could be accounting firms, it could be general insurance brokerages, and and things like that. So they're they're going really well, but again, they they. They need the they need the solutions that life is building as well to really drive their growth and and increase their capacity and capability. Um, there's the other end of the market where um, you have you know financial planning businesses or even risk specialist businesses as well where um, they're sort of struggling a bit with that complexity and uncertainty and and the and the economics of risk advice and and they're a bit stagnant at the moment that you know want to grow looking to grow want to create some value in their business but are not quite sure how and that's who we're helping to help uh, looking to help as well um, and then there's some other exciting businesses that we've seen in the market as well um, that you know, have taken a, a new fresh approach to targeting younger alive. So, you know, they do a mix of fee for service and, and commission own and, and commission as well. And, and they're doing really quite well and growing rapidly too. So, um, and then there's the other businesses that have stepped away from life insurance advice that we want to get back into the market. So they're ones with sort of a dormant business that would love to be activated. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, it, it's really important. Yeah, you know, we we can't. You know, life insurance is the pool of many, and currently the pool shrinking in terms of lives insured. We need you know more advisors to to really drive the growth of the pool and get more younger lives insured because we've got an aging pool of of insureds as well, which is an actuary's nightmare. That's right. Um, so interesting you say that. So um, if 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 you can get uh, an efficiency play of, of um, you know, a ninety percent reduction, and I'm out there and I've I've got a, a business that turns over, you know, um, one point two million dollars. I've got two advisors, um, and um, you know, twenty percent of my business is life insurance. And right now, and from anecdotal and from speaking to a lot of practices, um, generally it's very reactionary. They'll only do it if if they, if they basically get asked to do it. Um, you're probably going to. Um, assist those small business owners as a percentage more than these big corporates. Would you agree? Um, yeah, I think I think uh, everybody will everybody will benefit from LifeBid, but you know where the real upside for the industry and the and the and the you know the growth potential comes from is the ability for you know the suburban practices to reach the the unadvised cohort. <laughs> um, you know, you've got mums and dads out there that aren't getting the advice that they need because the premiums that they're paying aren't enough to cover the cost of the advice. So, um, yeah, that's where the largest upside will come for the, for the industry is getting getting the, the the small to medium businesses back into risk advice or focusing on it. it. You know, it could even be an investment, you know, super specialist business that employs a risk specialist. You know, they only do it if they have to at the moment, but they want to grow that side of their business and they employ that risk specialist. And um, it's really exciting. We're starting to see commentary from licensees saying, you know, risk advice is the next growth frontier for their advisors as well. And, um, and you know, some of the licensees that we've been talking to, they've been running, you know, scorecards on practices and the ones that do risk advice well, you know, are often have, you know, double the revenue and, and similarly more profitability compared to those that don't do risk advice or, you know, don't, you know, don't see it as a key, key component of their, their offering. And um, you mentioned there's a there's a, a, a capital raise event, a crowdfund coming up, and I think that's only days away. Um, there'll that's be right. details attached here. So when does that close out? Third uh, of October. Okay. Third and October. look, just playing devil's advocate, whenever we're asking people to to look into investing and whatnot, I like to ask some questions about sort of the governance of the business. Yep. So with 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 the the people involved, um, have you got a a board or an advisory board? Uh, yeah, so um, so with our working group, uh, we're supported by our platinum insurers. So that's Zurich and OnePath, that's MLC and TAL. So, um, so Zurich, OnePath, MLC, MLC and TAL. And TAL. Yep. yep. And then our gold insurers are PPS Mutual and Neos Life as well. So, yep. um, yeah, our group of our group of insurers are the ones that said, "Yeah, we need to fix this problem. We really want to support advice, and um, that's great." So each of those insurers has a seat on our board of advice as well. And so a, a curious look board. at your website is they've gone public as well. Yeah. So this is not a we hope it goes well. This is they're they're staking their reputation and um, on that as well. 
That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the yeah the industry needs it to go well. So, um, and then with uh, in addition to that, we have um, Ausbrokers, Australian Unity, Centrepoint Alliance, um, Fortnum, and MBS Insurance, and also Synchron as well um, as the licensees that have been working with us to. Um, to make sure that you know by you know cutting the time and cost served up to ninety percent, you got to do things a bit differently to make sure that you know our journeys for new business and renewals are compliant and things like that, and and when we need to meet the needs of their advisors, so they um they also have a seat on our board of advice too, um so they're part of the the project and the project governance, um and that that's a really important thing as well because they represent you know a couple of thousand employed, self employed, and self licensed advisors across the market as well. Yeah, look, and so, they're also got a vested interest in doing that, and. Um, you know, to all those people who are, who are listening to the podcast and for all those people on the Ensemble platform, um, I regularly see questions and answers about life insurance and, and uh, you know, a lot of people got into this industry and life insurance was a big part of it and it's kind of drifted, um, it commercially drifted to the side. So anything that can be done um, to get that back on the horse, so to speak, is, is well worth it. Um, probably what I was, I was just thinking out loud, probably need to get you to have a bit more detail, um, maybe with, with Ensemble, uh, get you chatting to the people who, uh, t- talk tech and, and a bit, a bit more around how you do things. And, um, we might look at doing that. But why I invited you today is that the backstory is great. You were, pre- you, you were born, literally born into it. Um, <laughs> you've seen, you know, the general life business, uh, overall business. You then, uh, they, you made the decision with your father to get specialized in life insurance. You then got specialized in business insurance. You parlayed into servicing self-managed super fund and inquiries and building the front of the funnel. You then realized that caused a problem and, and you've been following the bouncing ball. And I think that following, um, uh, continuing to follow this and, and your career and, and your success is going to be worth the squeeze. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for being on the engine room and uh, wish you all the success. Thanks, Roxy. Appreciate it. Thank you.